Well, hello and welcome YouTube, Mr. Robinson back here with yet another brand new exciting video, all math based of course, and as always it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you today as it is every day here in my virtual classroom. Step on inside as we dive into a brand new chapter in the Big Ideas Math Integrated Math 2 textbook, chapter 10 on circles. Now I don't know every single thing we'll hit on circles, I think I have that gist, but I'm not ready to lay them out for you right now. I know that we end on graphing, so I don't think we do graphing just yet. I don't think I have to use the calculator just yet either for what we're going to start with. Lines and segments inside of circles that intersect circles in very certain ways, whether it's the outside, whether it's twice on the inside, things like that. So that's what this 10.1 section is about. And I don't know what 10.2 is exactly following. Again, I didn't brief myself on it. Um, but when the video comes, it comes. Uh, now, fair warning with the chapter, you're going to get a lot of different diagrams and they're going to look a little weird. A lot of these lines inside and theorems and formulas and ways that they relate to certain things. I hope that we can look at one thing at a time and be okay with it, uh, at least in a nutshell with the section and as we review and stuff. So, you know, pause if you need to and follow along as you need to. Um, my, my personal intimidation is that with all these things, I'm sure they're going to ask for proofs and, you know, from, or construction or something like that. And so for me with those things, I'm like, oh. It just takes a while sometimes, and I, I don't always answer everything right off the bat. So anyway, with all that said, if you'd like to follow along with me, please go to the description section down below and find that PDF and follow with any timestamp with things as I begin with the lecture portion of this uh, section, and then I go to the whole problem set, which it goes to 40 some odd problems, so we'll go and take a look. But before that, let's go ahead and get started with that, ah, that lecture portion here on 10.1. I lost the page myself. 10.1, here we go identifying special segments and lines. What we will learn to do is identify those special segments and lines, draw and identify common tangents and use properties of tangents. It's okay if you don't know those, oh my gosh, there's a lot of words. I'll say if you, it's okay if you don't know those words, but there are quite a few of them for us to hit a uh, circle, the center of a circle, the radius of a circle. You might not know the word chord, that's okay, we'll jump into that together, you should know diameter. Secant and tangent are certain kinds of, you've, you've heard tangent in like Sokotoa, but tangent also has another different meaning that we might have heard before Sokotoa and trig, before trig. Um, they, they are related, it, sort of. You won't care to know about them, anyway. Point of tangency it has to do with tangent in and of itself, and tangent circles has to do with tangent. Concentric circles and common tangent. Wow, even some of these things I I knew, I just didn't know that they'd all show up together if I, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and jump into it. Identifying special segments and lines. All right, a circle is a set of all points in a plane that are equidistant from a given point called the center. You know, a circle has no sides to it, right? It's not a polygon. It doesn't have sides. It doesn't have angles. All of these things right here, I mean, these are all points that are on the circle point 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 and all these are the same distance away some radius that is all congruent right that's how you define a circle it's an enclosed shape two-dimensional and all that a circle with center p is called circle p and can be writ written as this so when you see circle p p is the center and that's what they're referring to so without the drawing boom like that okay that's how we're going to identify well, that's not how we're going to identify them, so we're going to identify circles. Lines and segments that intersect circles. There are different kinds here. You got the blue one here, that's the diameter. Diameter is a, oh, they define segment, a chord first. Uh, a segment um, whose endpoints are the center and any point on circles called the radius. So this guy right here, and all of them are the same distance away, like we said before. The new one for you might be the word chord. A chord is a segment drawn from any two points on a circle, like this one to this one right here. So, boom, end points on the circle, there's a chord. Here's another example of a chord. Here's another example of a chord. The diameter is an example of a chord, and it's the longest chord in the circle. It says it contains the center, so it passes through the center. So it's like a chord from point to point on the circle and passes through. A secant line intersects a circle in two points. So a chord, when extended forever, oh, they have it right here. So a line that extends forever, it contains a chord within right here, like that, for example, but that's a secant line. It touches it twice. Whereas a tangent line only touches a circle once and it hits at what's called the point of tangency. So a tangent line, how can you hit a circle once? You have to like, I mean, in a very specific way, it needs to just kind of kiss that and just boom, like that, just hit that one point. And that point's called the point of tangency on it. The tangent ray AB and the tangent segment AB are also called tangents. Okay, well any of this at AB stuff is also known as a tangent. What's over here? The word is in diameter. Okay. 
Um, identifying special segments and lines. Tell whether the line, ray, or segment is best described as a radius, chord, diameter, secant, or tangent of circle C. So looking at segment AC right here, AC is going to be a radius because it goes from center to end point of the circle. That's what they say there. Boom, radius. AB is the diameter. It's a chord that contains the center. So we, we, we know diameter is just that in general. Chord is probably new for you. That's a diameter. It's also a chord. Um, but very specifically, it's a diameter. It says best described. <clears throat> ray DE from D through E. It's a tangent ray. It's a tangent line. Boom. Or tangent lit ray, I should say. It's a tangent ray. It just hits that just at point B, that point of tangency right here. So that's known as a tangent ray on DE. And then AE touches two points on here. Although it... Oh, where's E? Wait. Oh, I guess E's right here. So AE is a uh, secant line because it hits at two points there, so secant. Okay, moving forward, we have coplanar circles and common tangents. Let's let's move forward. I know I'm just hitting the lecture stuff. I kind of want to go more quickly than I am. Um, get a different color. In a plane, uh, coplanar circles and common tangents. In a plane, two circles can intersect in two points, one point, or no points. Yeah, so I have two circles here, right? They can either hit each other twice, once, tangentially, if they do, they're called tangent circles, or not at all. They can be separate from each other, or one could be inside of the other. Now, it doesn't have to be directly inside the other like this, but if they share a common center, they're said to be concentric. So these are concentric circles, kind of like a dartboard has concentric circles, something like that. Um, and these are called tangent circles if they only intersect once. They're showing, they're drawing a tangent line to hint at the point that you can draw a single tangent line through those two circles, and therefore they are tangent circles. A liner segment's tangent to two coplanar circles is called a common tangent. So if you can draw something, I, I'm sure they're gonna have us draw them, or they're, yeah, they're gonna draw them for us down there. But again, a liner segment tangent to two coplanar circles. So two circles on the same plane, I can draw a tangent line to both of these. It's called a common tangent, a tangent that's hitting both of them, boom, boom, like that. A common internal tangent intersects the segment that joins the centers of the two circles. So if I have two circles, uh, like here, if I have two circles here and I have a segment that joins them, well, I can't draw an internal tangent there. Like this one right here, and I draw a segment through them, a tangent line that goes through these two, boom, like that, it hits tangentially here and here, that's called an internal tangent. Whereas an external, common external tangent doesn't intersect the segment that joins the two circles. So here's an example of an external tangent hitting boom, boom right here, but never intersects with that one. I don't really use those phrases very often, so sorry if I'm kind of rusty with them. Drawing and identifying common tangents. Tell how many common tangents the circles have and draw them. Use blue to indicate common external tangents and red to indicate common internal tangents. So yeah, the, the blue ones, they have them drawn for us. So if you look at this drawing right here, now we draw four different common tangents that they have. Two external tangents right here, common external tangents in blue, and in red, the ones that go in between them that, again, they intersect tangentially because they touch at just single points right there and there, but they cross through that segment that joins the two centers. Now, when you have two um, uh, tangent circles like this one, there's only a single tangent that can be drawn through the middle right here, and that's the internal one instead of two of them just a single one, and then you have these blue ones, these external tangents. Whereas this one, you have two common tangents right here, but they're just external ones. You can't draw internal ones within because they would not draw, you know, if I touch just one of them on the inside, it doesn't touch the other one at the inside once, it touches it secantly. I, I don't know what the word is. Okay, um, let's look at some theorems. Tangent line to a circle theorem, this is a big one. In a plane, a line is tangent to a circle if and only if, and if and only if means it's biconditional, the line is perpendicular to a radius of the circle at its end point on the circle. So I have a radius here, QP, from Q to P, right? That's a radius. And the perpendicular line to that radius that intersects with the radius there at that point is a tangent line. That's what they're telling you. They're also telling you wherever a radius intersects, a radius intersects with the tangent line, it's intersecting with it perpendicularly. So that's the if and only if part about that. It works both ways. Which one's the version? Uh, if, if, the, if the tangent line intersects with the radius, then it's perpendicular to it's the original. The converse is if it's perpendicular to it, then it's a tangent line. 
The external tangent congruence theorem states if you have two external tangents, like from S, remember this line could go forever like that. <laughs> Same with this one right here. But those points R and T from S to R and from S to T, they're congruent to each other. They're both the same distance away in any such set that you have from the same point. Tangent lines from a common external point are congruent. Boom, boom, and boom, boom. So that's what they're bringing up on that. Um, I'm sure we're going to have to prove it. And that one's a pretty easy proof. Once you have this right angle thing, and that's going to be used a lot, that's a pretty easy proof to do. Verifying a tangent to a circle. Is the line ST a tangent to circle P? Well, it is a tangent if this is a right angle. And this is a right angle if this is a right triangle. So what they're going to do is use the converse of the Pythagorean theorem. They're going to see if 12 squared plus 35 squared equals 37 squared. Let's see. It does. They say that it does. I don't know the math for it. But they said because it does, it's a right triangle. And if it's a right triangle, this makes a right angle. Therefore, being perpendicular to this, that means that this is tangentially. It's, it's a tangent to circle P indeed. Yes. Uh, finding the radius of a circle. So right here, this time, you have once again a, they, they must, okay, point B is a point of tangent C. That means this is a tangent line. That means this makes a right angle, which means it's a right triangle. So we can use Pythagorean theorem again, like R squared plus 80 squared equals, but we got to do 50 plus R squared here, which means we're going to have to do, um, you have to expand that binomial down here. So R plus 50 squared expands to this guy, right? And then you solve, looks like the R squareds cancel out. You solve for R, you get 39. So the radius is 39 feet. I'll do more of those, but it's a Pythagorean theorem setup, just making sure you use your a squared plus b squared equals c squared properly on them. Uh, constructing a tangent to a circle. I've actually never done that before, so let's see what they say. Given, I'm trying to think if I could, okay, given uh, circle C and point A, construct a line tangent to circle C that passes through A, use a compass and straight edge. So first, they draw a segment AC and then they construct the bisectors. They got to do a perpendicular bisector version, but the goal is to just get that point, I guess they're saying. And then construct. So now, okay, now M is going to be the center of this circle AC. So now they get to draw a circle around there. And wherever B hits right here, okay, wherever B hits right here from A to B is going to be a tangent line. Uh, I think I can make sense of that because these two should be the same distance away right? This is congruent to that. Those two are congruent to each other at these two points, boom, here and here. And two points that are equidistant are also touching tangentially on those points, which totally makes sense to me. So that's what you're going to do. Basically draw a second circle. The, the point isn't the circle. The point is having two points that should be the same distance away here and here. And those should be just based on the nature of how this is a circle being drawn uh, so those chords are the same and therefore they should be tangential. So I dig it. Works for me. All right. Using properties of tangents. RS is tangent. I'm still in the example set. How long have I gone? Oh, 13 minutes. Uh, segment RS is tangent circle C and RT is tangent circle C. That means these two will be equal in length, right? Boom, boom. So 28 equals 3x plus 4. We want to find the value of x there. And subtract 4 and divide by 3. You get x equals 8. Okay. Monitoring progress stuff, yada, yada. Okay, and okay, that's it for that set. Let's just go ahead and move forward to that stuff. Sorry if I if I seemed a little like, I don't know where we're going with it because I didn't know what the whole section was covering. I saw that, I saw the glossary terms, you know, the vocab and all that stuff. But I, I don't know to what extent the book was going to do things. As you can tell, we weren't doing any graphs. We didn't really use a calculator unless we do Pythag the Pythagorean theorem test. I really had no need for a calculator. So I was kind of just winging it. I do that often, but sometimes I'm a little more prepared as far as this is, I know what they're going to ask for special right triangles. This has been a long time coming. There's so many ways you can ask questions here. I haven't done things with internal and external tangents before, so that's even new for me. But it seems reasonable in what we're doing. Okay, let's do the vocabulary and core concept check and see what we got in numbers one through four to begin with before we do the official problem set. There's a writing question. How are chords and secants alike and how are they different? Well, I was explaining how they were alike. Meanwhile, they seem to ignore it. So now they're letting me be hero and do that. So a secant is a line that touches two points on a circle. And a chord is a segment that touches two points on a circle. Every secant 
contains a chord, right? Every secant contains a chord. Be somewhere, a line contains a segment, and because it touches those two endpoints, it does that. So how are they the same? They touch two points on a circle. How are they different? One's a line, one's a segment. Okay, writing. Explain how you can determine from the context whether the words radius and diameter are referring to segments or lengths. What? Explain how you can determine from the context. What do they mean from the context? If they're talking about something like if it has a segment bar above it, I don't know. When they're talking, I think, you know, if they say here's a radius, they're probably talking about the actual segment itself, just the physical thing. Same with here's the diameter, like the object. When they're talking about its measure, the, the measure of the radius is whatever. And I don't know if that's the wording that they've said, but it's, they say find the measure of the radius, then that would be length. Uh, if they're asking, so I'm going to say it like that. If they're asking about the measure, let's italicize that, of the radius or diameter, they are referring to its length. Otherwise, just the segment itself. I think that makes sense to me. All right, number three, complete the sentence. Coplanar circles have a common center called... Coplanar circles Co Coplanar circles have a common center called Oh, are called. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I I I thought they said coplanar circles I don't know what I thought it asked. Coplanar circles that have a common center are called concentric. Okay. I was very I was reading it wrong. Um, yeah, these are con concentric circles. I do not know how I was reading that, but I, as you heard me say it, I was like, what? What are they asking for? Yes, they are concentric circles. Concentric circles are coplanar circles that have a common center. Number four, which one doesn't belong? Which segment does not belong with the other three? Explain your reasoning. Well, let's say chord is A. Chord is something that's inside the circle. Uh, it doesn't necessarily go through the center. Okay. Radius is something inside the circle. Okay, tangent is something outside the circle. I think that's the one that's different. So I think that these ones are inside the circle. And tangent's outside the circle. I think that's the idea. Inside circle. Or this is outside circle. I was thinking before ones that hit the center. I was, I was ready to say that the chord was different than the other ones. Because radius and diameter both hit the center of the circle. But the tangent line does not. It never does uh, on that one. Okay, guys, with those ones in mind, that was the first set. A little bumpy for me. Sorry about that. I'm not reading well tonight. Let's go ahead and dive into the official problem set. We got several to do here. We're going to go from numbers 5 to 48. Oh, it's not just page 578. Why did I only write that? It goes 578 to 580. Let me, uh, let me just update that. Speaking of rust, 578 to 580. Got it. Okay, let's start with numbers 5 through 10, where we use this diagram. And we are naming the circle. Okay, so um, if you don't mind me, I'll just keep that diagram right there. Naming the circle, this is known as circle C because it's based off the center. I can do it like this or I can literally write out circle C. But that's a symbol of a circle with a center on it. That's number five. Number six, name two radii. Radii is the plural for radius. So radiuses. Uh, ones that go from the circle to endpoints. I can see one right here that goes from... C to D, that means there's a radius that's C, D, and there's a radius that's C, A. Remember, those are segments. So when I say C, D, I need a segment bar, and C, A, those are radii. Let's see, radii. Okay, number seven. Name two chords. Chords are segments that go th to different endpoints on the circle. Chords. So one of them is actually from A to D, the diameter. The diameter is also a chord. Okay. So AD, again, also the diameter. And then from H to B, H to B right here would be another example of a chord. So HB. And those are also segments. Number eight, name a diameter. Well, that's also segment AD. That diameter is the longest chord in here. 
diameter. Segment AD, again, also a chord. Number nine, name a secant. Secant is a line. It's a line, and it's going to be touching two points on this thing. So um, I could call it, I have, I have several different ways I can call it, but I am referring to, whoops, not secant, or not line, let me say secant. It's the same line. We're all talking about this line right here. <laughs> I'm not doing very well with the drawing thing here. We're, we're talking about this line right here, but there are several points on it. There's K, B, J, H, and G. You have to use any two, and they all refer to the same line. If I called it line KB or KJ or KH or KG, I'm good. I could call it line BH, for example, but I do have to put the line and the arrows and stuff to indicate it's going all the way through there, but all of those points are collinear, but BH is a totally fine to say, a totally fine thing to say there. But any of those are in reference to that same secant, and a secant touches two points in the circle. Number 10, name a tangent and point of tangency. So the tangent line is this other one that's down here. And like I said, with these three letters, you can use any of those three, let's say GE. So for tangent, line GE works. You can call it a ray or something as well. Um, point of tangency, point of tangency, pot. Um, you might be watching this on 420. Eh? Uh, it's, it's F. F is a point of tangency. It's the one point that you that the line touches the circle that's number 10. okay numbers 11 through 14 copy the diagram done actually i'm gonna actually copy and paste tell how many common tangents the circles have and draw them so on number 11 there we go on number 11 you have two circles that don't touch each other at all but they should share some tangent lines they have external tangents internal tangents things like that the external ones are probably the easier ones to make mention of they're the ones you probably think about more when you think about tangency and i gotta kind of rough it out here and figure out how it's going to go um so like this right they touch those two points boom like that on the circles and then like i don't know, let's pretend like those ones are going to be touching so here are some two external tangents like that there are also two internal tangents you can draw ones, and I'll do them in red, I think the book also did that same kind of thing, that you can touch these two circles at one point each, kind of like that, boom, boom. And it's an internal tangent because it's crossing through that center, right? That center that, excuse me, not the center, a secant, uh, a segment that hits these two points in the center. So as long as it intersects there, it's called an internal, a uh, common internal um, tangent, I believe is the way that they said it. It's the wording. So there's another one that's down here or that goes down this way. Boom, like that. It should probably have arrows on them. But that's another one like that. So there are four of them. There are four of them. Uh, there are two internal and two external. Okay. Number 12. Now you have a circle within a circle, but it's not concentric. It's not concentric. I don't think this would have any tangents because the outer circle can only have tangents that go outside of the circle, right? That's literally what tangents are. They only stay on the outside of the circle. So it kind of looks like a teddy bear that's missing an eye. Here, let me give it its other eye. Hi, I'm a teddy bear. Have you seen my other eye? Oh, I'm so cute. I'm just going to lay flat like that gonna have a little smile now it looks like a piggy actually wait yeah bear would have oh i guess that's the nose huh i guess the smile would be there there we go that makes more sense anyway what was i doing let's go back um okay if i draw any if i draw any uh, tangent lines outside here there's no way it's going to be touching anything on that inside circle so they wouldn't have a common tangent but i draw any ones on the inside of this circle they'd act as secant lines for this other one so it has zero it has zero um, tangents, zero common tangents. When I say tangents, I do mean common tangents for that one. All right. Thanks, Mr. Teddy Bear. Number 13. Two circles. They, they look congruent, and they look like they're crossing through two points together. Now, as I recall talking about this in the lecture portion, they would clearly share external tangents. It seems like they'd be parallel with each other the common ones at least. 
So if I draw, you know, common tangent, yeah, it looks like it's a nice good old horizontal line right there. Pretend like it has arrows. And then I'd have another one that would go, you know, like this. So they each have two set, sets of tangents. They're parallel to each other. Um, but two. Two. Two external tangents. No internal ones. The segment that goes through here, anything I'd have to cross through, would a tangent of one would be the secant of the other. So just two external tangents. And then number 14. This is a, a set of um, tangent circles. I was thinking of what kind of drawing I could make out of this thing. Kind of looks like an eyeball now, right? So if I had a second eyeball there, I don't think I'll play around with that. But they only intersect together just at a single point like that. Now that point could also be the point of tangency for both of them. So boom, there's one point of tangency right there, just that external, one external, one right there. So one and one external, just like that. And there's the drawing of it for tangent lines. Okay, that is numbers 11 through 14. Let's keep moving forward to exercises 15 to 18. Tell whether the common tangent is internal or external. They don't say explain why, which thank goodness. Uh, number 15, I'm just going to keep, keep the drawing there. That is an external tangent. Uh, well, actually, the explanation isn't bad. Basically, if I draw a line between, a segment between the two centers, does it intersect the centers? That's pretty much all we're going to answer, right? Number 16, as we move forward, it does intersect there. Therefore, it is an internal tangent tangent. So number 16 is an internal. 17 and 18 must be, on the, uh, must be on the next page. So number 17, right here, this would also intersect that segment that connects the two circles. Therefore, it's an internal tangent. I'm guessing 18 is external. Let's see. Number 18, yeah. So number 18, there's a uh, segment that would join these two that's like this, but it doesn't intersect those one. I guess that's that's another good definition of being external for that one. So that would be my explanation, although I didn't write it and they didn't ask us to. That's what I'm saying out loud. Again, that's not stuff I really practiced by by uh, in any sort of way before. This stuff I would have practiced at the time, so let's take a look. In exercises 19 to 22, tell whether AB, segment AB, is tangent circle C, explain your reasoning. So if you were with me during the lecture portion, we learned a theorem that a radius intersects with a tangent line uh, at a 90 degree angle. So if this is a 90 degree angle, then that means that this is a tangent line. And this is a 90 degree angle if this is a right triangle. This is a right triangle if a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So we got to check, does 3 squared plus 4 squared equal 5 squared? Uh, indeed it does, given the Pythagorean triple that it is. So 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. So uh, it's a right triangle. CAB is a right triangle, therefore, Segment CA is perpendicular to segment AB, and AB is tangent circle C. I don't know if I want to write all that each time, but that's the basis of how we came up with that answer, the conclusion. It's this, therefore this, therefore this, therefore that, therefore that. Basically, right angle here would mean that's a tangent. And it's a right angle, so it's a right triangle. So yeah, all the stuff we said before. Now I wonder, because this doesn't really look drawn to scale to be a tangent line, so I'm guessing maybe it's not, and plus we have to have one that's not at some point. So let's check out 9 squared plus 15 squared and all that kind of stuff. Given that dividing by 3 would give me 3, 5, 6, I haven't heard of that as a right triangle before. Uh, 9 squared, by the way, that's 9 plus 16 is 25. 9 squared plus 15 squared, that's 81 plus 2, 25, which is 306. Uh, that doesn't equal 18 squared. 18 squared is 324, so 306 don't equal, this is 25 equals 25, this is 306, which doesn't equal 324. Therefore, not tangent. I'm just going to put not tangent. So AB is tangent. This other one, not tangent. Number 21. Now, CA, C, we're trying to see whether AB is tangential to this thing here. We still want to see whether this is a right triangle or not. The diameter, AD is a diameter, which means CA is still a radius. 
So if the radius intersects with a point there at a right angle, it's still tan tan tangential. It could be a diameter though as well. Now the thing is when they measure this, I believe they're saying this little part alone is just 20. I guess that means this other part's also gonna be 20 because radii are, are congruent, which means all of AD is 40. So we're trying to see on number 21 whether 40 squared plus 48 squared equals 60 squared. Now, I don't know that off the top of my head, but if you divide these by four, you get 10, 12, and 15. I don't know that as a Pythagorean triple. I'm gonna guess this isn't true. 1600, this is where I gotta use my own little calculator. Let me just try this. 40 squared is 1600. 48 squared, I don't know what it is, but when you add it, three, 3904, and that 60 squared is 3600. So 3904 doesn't equal 3600. So this is not tangent not tangent here as well. Um, and again, the buildup for this was recognizing you can still use this to determine whether or not it's a right triangle. It, it wasn't. Um, a squared plus B squared doesn't equal C squared. And the diameter can still be used in the radius talk, as we mentioned before. And all radii are congruent. If this is 20, that's 20. And uh, yeah, didn't seem to work out for us. The number 22. Now we have eight on the outside here, right? We have an eight on the outside, but we have this 12 on the inside. Now all radii are congruent. That means this is also 12. So what we're actually dealing with here is a hypotenuse, not just of eight, but eight plus 12, which is 20. So we got to check and see whether 12 squared, that radius plus the tangent, the, the tan possible tangent line, um, plus 16 squared is 20 squared. Divide those by four, you do get three, four, five in that set. This is going to be true. Uh, this is going to be 400 equals 400. So this is going to be indeed tangent in this case. Right, you can check, but you're trying to see that through Pythagorean theorem. Okay, number 23 to 26, point B is a point of tangent C, find the radius R of circle C. So this time they're telling you it's a tangent, that will let you know about the right angle thing. However, they drew the right angle for you, how, how nice. They're saying find the radius. Um, this was, I think there was a lecture question. Yeah, there's a lecture question like this. So Pythagorean theorems to set up. Just keep in mind, this whole hypotenuse is r plus 16. That means we've got to use a little bit of algebra. We're going to say a squared plus b squared equals c squared, like that. Now, r squared plus, uh, that's 576. And this is um, expanding this to a perfect square trinomial. You get r squared plus 32r plus 256. This was back in first semester, so I'm not going to explain that in full. I just want to tell you it's not r squared plus 256. It's not r squared plus 16 squared. Uh, r squareds cancel out if you subtract them, so those are gone, boom. And I'll keep the 32r over here. If I subtract 256 and I get 32r equals 320. So yeah, that makes sense, and r is 10. So your radius is 10, just 10 units, doesn't look like we have centimeters, inches, anything like that, and we're all set on 23. Number 24, I mean, all these are the same when all said and done. So if I assign it to my students, I'm not going to keep giving them the same kind of problem. Let's do r squared plus 9 squared, those two legs. And let's compare it to r plus 6 quantity squared, that hypotenuse. And it is a hypotenuse. This is a right triangle. So r squared plus 81 equals, and these are smaller numbers. We got r squared plus 12r plus 36. r squareds cancel once again. And 12r, it's same kind of deal of these problems. Subtract that, you get 45. So R is 45 over 12. Is that 45? 45. Yeah, I think so. So 45 over 12, which reduces to, you can divide it by 3, 15 over 4. Uh, as an exact answer, that would be 3.75. So the radius one or the other there, that's how that one works. Good thing we don't have a guess and check measure in place. Number 25. This continues. I don't have much to say on the matter. Hopefully it's making sense so far. R squared plus 14 squared. This is our a squared plus b squared. And here's R plus seven quantity squared. So this is uh, 196. And this is R squared plus 14 R plus 49. The R squareds cancel, hip hip hooray. 14 R equals, subtract 49 over, you get 147. And R is 147 over 14. Um, oh, that yeah, that does divide by 7. I don't know why I lost that. That's 21 over 2, 
for that 10.5. I was going to say, that's a weird number. I don't know if I love it. It's good enough for me. And then the last one, I mean, these aren't Pythagorean triples, if that, if that helps you. First one was. Last one, number 26. You have r squared plus 30 squared here. And over here, you have r plus 18 quantity squared. So r squared plus 900. And this is r squared plus 36r, double 18 times r. And then 18 squared is 324. R squareds cancel, you are left with 36R on this side. And on that side, you have 576. So R equals 576 over 36. Now, I don't know whether that divides evenly. Let me first try that. And if it does, then I'll leave it. It does, it gets 16. So your radius here is 16. And that's number 26. Okay, those are those four. It seems like that was a good... Check for just making sure that you know how the right angle thing works. I mean, they told us, they showed us the right angle thing, and they didn't have to. When they said it was a point of tangency, I think we should have been okay. All right, they, we are going to do construction. We're going to construct circle C with the given radius and point A outside of circle C. Then construct a line tangent circle C that passes through A. So let me get a circle. Um, and I'm not going to use circle tool. I'm just So I'm not going to go like, all right, I did this, whereas you have to go use a compass. Have fun. Um, now, the compass isn't going to be much different when I do this, but let's call this center at circle C. So there's its center. I need a 2-inch radius. I forgot about that, actually. I need a ruler, and my 2 inches will go, there's 0 to 2, and let's get a compass. Ta-da! Let's get a compass there. And let's measure out two inches like that. And let's draw ourselves a two inch circle. Now this is on whatever screen you're looking at. It's not two inches in my book, really. It looks a little oversized, but that's not the point. I don't really need that right now. So there's my circle C. Let's move it down a little bit. There we go. Okay, now they want to circle a, a point A that's outside of the circle. I don't know how far outside I can go. Uh, they just said outside of it. I guess right here is going to work for me. So here's a point A. Because um, this thing will snap in place. I need to move it like right on that line with the other one. So like same line together like that. Okay. So what we have to do is construct a line. So what you might have seen is there will essentially be a segment from C to A. We have to find its midpoint what would bisect it basically, a perpendicular bisector, if you will. But find its midpoint, so then we're going to have a brand new circle from C to A that's going to hit the circle at two points, at two points. So let's do perpendicular bisector by drawing some arcs above and below. Well, that circle arc already would have worked, so let me just let me just do another arc somewhere else. Let me do a little bit bigger. And let's connect something above here. Let's do, let's use green. So above here and then down there. This is stuff that we did back in, I don't know, I want to say chapter six with triangle stuff with perpendicular bisectors. So I'll do it below here and up here. Wherever these two guys intersect, we're going to draw a line through those two sets of points, and that'll be the perpendicular bisector. The only thing that matters for me is the center that we get out of this thing. So this, it's going to be my close enough, gives me this point right here. Do they tell you what they make it? No, I think they used the letter M. I think they used the letter M at the time. So I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing. So I have a brand new circle, if you call it M, and or a brand new center for a circle. And I'm going to be drawing a circle around there by using A and C as basically endpoints, or points that are on the circle, basically endpoints of a diameter. Um, yeah, let's use this and still in green right here. So there's that, see how it kind of passes through A and C? It's supposed to at least. So there's this other circle, and then these two points right here, where this circle intersects with the circle, not that line, but where the circle intersects with the circle here and here, are basically supposed to be equidistant from each other. Is it perfect? No, it's not. Um, let me, I guess this should be moved up a little bit just because the way that it snapped. So, okay, let's just pretend like it's hitting there and there. That's fine. Now, either of these points should be considered points of tangency from A. So if I drew a line now 
which I'll make, I guess, purple, or a ray, if you will. But if I drew something from A through that point, it should be tangential to the circle. It pretty much is. So there's an example of a tangent line. It only touches the circle at one point, just that red point, boom, right there, and gleams off after that. Remember, this has a radius of two, two inches. So this thing right here is two inches. And then with that point A, we were able to construct all that. So construct a line tangent C that passes through A. This is the one. Oh, they wanted a line, not a ray. So let me do that passes through A. And let me get another arrow on that thing. There we go. It's the purple line right there. So I could not delete, but I could hide everything, make it a little more transparent. That's not the purple line. Let's make them a lot less, you know, a lot more like that. And boom, I have that line. And there's that point of tangency. Let's get those a little more transparent as well. By a little more, I mean a lot more. There we go. All right, so there's the first one, number 27. Now, number 28's the same thing, only 4.5 centimeters. 4.5 centimeters isn't much from two inches. I don't know if I want to do this twice. Um, I mean, really? Here's So here's two inches, like that. And here's 4.5 centimeters, like that. With your permission, can I move on? This circle is not going to look significant. Listen, wherever you choose to have that point, A will be farther or closer up, but this was the construction of it. With your permission, I'm going to move on. It's my it's my own way of balking at a problem just because it's, it's, it's even very identical in size. It's not identical, but it's very similar in size. It's just nothing new will be constructed out of it other than having A just in a different spot, but it's all the same. All right, in exercises 29 to 32, points B and D are points of tangency. Find the values of X. Points of tangency that meet at a common external point are congruent to each other, so these should be the same. When they ask to find the value of X, I'm going to set 2X plus 7 equal to 5X minus 8. I mean, the algebra after this is fine. Subtract 2X from both sides, add 8 to both sides, divide, whoops, add 8 to both sides, divide both sides by 3. That's all great. But the setup of that one is all, you know, and making sure that you know exactly what's going on. You set these two things equal to each other. So these will be very quick questions. Number 29, those two things are equal. Number 30, these two things are equal. 31 and 32. Now in 31 and 32, you do have quadratics, so we'll be able to do more with them. That's good. So 3x plus 10 equals 7x minus 6. Once again, let's subtract 3x from both sides, add 6 to both sides, and divide both sides by 4. I'll get x equals 4. It's very, very fast. Number 31. Oh, by the way, I you know what? I'm I'm very I'm sorry about this if there was something that was not seen here. I'm very forgetful that my picture is cutting off part of a problem. So if I was like doing something right here and you couldn't see any of it, I really do apologize. Here's the circle in its entirety. My bad if there was something that was in the way. I am absolutely forgetful sometimes that I'm blocking parts of a problem because I'm not I'm not looking at that part of the of my laptop screen, my desktop screen. Number 31 and 32. Once again, you set them equal to each other, but now we're solving quadratics. So number 31, and this is a more basic version. We can solve using square roots. 2x plus 4 equals 22. We get to subtract 4 from both sides, divide both sides by 2, and then take the square root of both sides. Now, we've been dealing with x's and r's or whatever, being a physical component of something. And this one is no doubt that thing as well. But distance can always be only be positive. That doesn't mean x can't also be negative. x in this case is plus or minus 3 because, well, I, we should know that algebraically, but we're allowed to have the negative in this case here. Having a negative 3 doesn't change a, b being a positive set. 2 times negative 3 squared plus 4 is 2 times 9 plus 4. It's still positive. So plus or minus 3 is allowed in that problem. Number 32, it might be more of the same on number 32, or maybe not because there's a linear portion and you've got to just be careful on stuff. So let's see how number 32 works with that. So it's a little different. 3x squared plus 2x minus 7 equals 2x plus 5. 
All right, the two X's are going to cancel, so they're not getting deep into quadratic territory here as far as like, you know, what we might have to do. So 3X squared minus 7 equals 5. I'll add 7. Divide both sides by 3 and take the square root of both sides. Now we got plus or minus 2. Now, do both positive and negative 2 work? I, they might because 2 times negative 2, let's check this. I mean, I think the positive one will work, right? 2 times 2 plus 5 is 9. 3 times 2 squared, 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12, plus 2 times 2 is 4, so 16 minus 7 is 9. So those check out for positive 2. Let's check out negative 2. It should work. There's nothing that made this extraneous, and 2 times negative 2 is still positive, uh, plus 5 is still a positive number. That's 1. 3 times negative 2 quantity squared plus 2 times negative 2 plus 7, minus 7, excuse me, minus 7, that's still tw for the 12. And then minus 4 is 8, minus 7 is 1. So those also check out. So both work. Both work. The only time that that might not work that I'm concerned about is if you're getting a negative length, not about extraneous solutions, but if you're getting a negative length out. All right, number 33, error analysis. Let's describe and correct the error in determining whether x, y is tangent to, c, to z. They got 11 squared plus 60 squared equals 61 squared. I don't know, should I take their word for it that that's true? That it's a right, oh, here's the problem. So they're going off of, they're saying, okay, here's the right angle. No, 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 no. When something's a tangent, this has to be the right angle over here. So their problem isn't maybe the numbers, but just the fact that they have the right angle kind of expressed in the wrong place for this thing here. Uh, so that angle X is not necessarily a right angle, whereas only angle Z is the right angle. Although they use the converse of the Pythagorean theorem to confirm they have a right triangle. The right angle is not with the radius and the tangent uh, and the supposed tangent line. So that so angle X is not a right angle and xy is not tangent to z. So I'm correcting the problem. That's segment xy and that's circle z. So if I want to kind of come up with those, that's segment xy, that's angle x. I hope that's okay that I put it that way. And here's circle z. All right, that's number 33. So there's nothing really correct. I mean, I stated that it's not a thing, but there's no way to make it a tangent if it wasn't to begin with. Number 11, describe and correct the error in finding the radius of circle t. So the radius is from t to u or t to s. 39 squared minus 36 squared is 15 squared, so the radius is 15. Well, 15 would be this whole thing here. That's the diameter. So the radius should be half that amount because each of these are congruent to each other. So divide those things by 2. So their problem is, I, I mean, they did some good work. They said, uh, because that's a diameter and it's intersecting with that line right there and that I guess they're saying, I think the book said, and I didn't read it out loud, but I read it on one of the things. They said, assume points that uh, lines that look tangent are tangent. So that one that we're looking at here, I guess we're assuming is tangent. So that's, that's fine. It's whatever. The problem is they found a diameter, not a radius. 15 is the diameter, not the radius, which should be half. Should be half the diameter. So 15 divided by 2 is 7.5. The rest is fine. Okay, that's number 34. Number 35 on abstract reasoning. For a point outside of a circle, how many lines exist tangent to the circle that pass through the point? How many such lines exist for a point on the circle, inside the circle? Explain your reasoning. Excuse me. Um, so point outside the circle, there should be two. So... Let's draw a circle. Boom. Let's place a point. Let's do these in like three different parts. There's like a part A with point A, a part B with point B on the circle, and a part C with point C inside the circle right here. So part A, we can have two tangent lines. So we can have a tangent line here, boom, and a tangent line here, boom. So as far as that part A goes, two, two tangent lines. Part B, just one, the tangent line itself, like the one that hits just that one point, it would just be boom like that. Sorry, let me do that again. 
So boom, just that one tangent line is the only time that it hits the one that's on the circle, so one. And part C, I mean, tangent lines intersect outside the circle, so part C is zero. There's none that I can draw through this point that's tangential to this because it would always be a secant line that goes through. And again, assume these things are lines or rays or whatever. Uh, so that's number 35. Number 36 on critical thinking. Excuse me, why do well two lines tangent to the same circle not intersect to justify your answer? Uh, we saw that actually. It was two parallel lines. So there was a previous problem. I already did a lot of work. Uh, right here, number 13. These two were pretty much parallel to each other. You had like congruent circles and all that stuff. And if those tangent lines are parallel, they'll never intersect. I mean, did they say... I don't know if they're asking you what kind of appearance do the things need to have. I'd say the circles need to be congruent, right? So when will two tangent lines, oh, to the same circle. Okay, well, they'd still be parallel. So that was a different scenario on number 13, the same circle. I thought they meant a common tangent to two circles. So right here, if I have two parallel lines, then they won't intersect, but still, what's the scenario for which that will kind of come about is, I guess, kind of another question in and of itself. So if I have a tangent line here, just pretend like it's horizontal. I mean, it is horizontal, but pretend like you could do that yourself. Horizontal, horizontal. Okay, they're parallel, they'll never intersect. But what's that actual case? What's going to cause that is the question. Um, basically, they'd be endpoints of a diameter because, remember, radius intersects with a tangent at that 90-degree angle, all that stuff. So that's a radius... But that's another radius right there, and therefore these two are just opposite ends of a diameter. So, when will two lines tangent to the same circle not intersect? They, two tangent lines won't intersect when they are parallel, which would occur on opposite sides of oh, a oh, circle's diameter. That's what I'm going with there. Okay, and that's because the right angle things and the radius and all that kind of stuff. All right, let's move on to number 37 using structure. Each side of quadrilateral T, V, W, X is tangent to Y. I feel like this is something I got to copy and paste. Right there. Find the perimeter of the quadrilateral. Um, okay, I've seen problems like this before. So this is one where all these points, I mean, don't see it like a quadrilateral right now. Like just like just look at X right here. See just this part as that theorem that we know about. This point is tangent to that point right there and that point right there. And when we're tangent to those two points, we're the same distance away here and here. That means these are congruent to each other. Those are congruent to each other right there. So the whole thing's 8.3. I mean, that doesn't really dispel everything we need. But those two are congruent here, here. These two on W, from W to the point in tangency, are congruent here, here. And V, I use the, uh, shoot, I use the one tick mark for the longest part and the four tick mark for the smallest part here. Basically, if this is one, I think they mean this part's 1.2, then this part's 1.2. The whole thing's 4.5, which means, I mean, oh, each of those are 3.3. I guess that works. They add up to that amount, 3.3, 3.3, .3, and 3.1. This would be 3.1 right here. So if the whole thing's 8.3, 3.1 minus 8.3 is 5.2. So this is also 5.2. I guess the whole point was figuring out what this is right here because we can add 4.5, the sum of these two, 8.3, and the sum of those two. So the perimeter, the perimeter of quadrilateral T, V, W, X is, let's see this down below, is 4.5 plus 3.3 plus 3.1. I'm putting those together to show it's a whole side. Uh, plus that 8.3 plus all of 5.2 plus 1.2. Another side. So four sides of this thing. So 4.5 plus, let's see them all together, 6.4. 8.3 and another 6.4. I didn't know that. Um, so 12.8. I don't want to get this wrong. 12.8, uh, 17.3, and 
25.6. I think 25.6 is the perimeter of that guy. All right, that's number 37. Let's go to number 38, logic. In circle C, radii CA and CB are perpendicular. BD and AD are tangent to C. I feel like I gotta draw this. Let me, whenever I draw these things, because the center doesn't stay, I gotta kind of make a center first and then draw a circle around it, kind of like that, because now I have a certain, now I have a center. Uh, radii CA, let me thin this out a little bit, CA and CB are perpendicular. So if I drew a radius, I'll kind of do it like horizontal and vertical to make it easy. So I can call this maybe CA and call this CB. So those are radii, perpendicular, so CA and CB. They say BD and AD are tangent to C. Now to be... To be both tangent and to be sharing the same point, they would have to basically, remember, tangent will be perpendicular to a radius. So basically, D is somewhere out here, right? I can draw, you know, perpendicular to a horizontal line to vertical line. So I know that I'm going to have a tangent line that kind of looks like that. And then I'll have a horizontal line that's tangential to this one because that's what makes the right angle here. So point D... Do they say they're lines or rays or what? They say they're lines. So I'm going to kind of go like extendo with arrows and extendo with arrows here. And these two points where they intersect basically make up D. I think that's the only point that, that uh, that's the only way it's going to work. Line DB, line DA, like that tangent to C. That's how we're going to be able to see it. Okay. What do they want? <laughs> sketch it. Oh, I just did. Cool. I didn't even know that was what they wanted. So part A, sketch it. What are they asking us? What shape that makes? I bet that's going to be their question. Hold on. Those are right angles. We should know that. What? Yeah, what type of quadrilateral C, A, D, B? Explain your reasoning. Well, guys, these are congruent to each other in their own way. These are congruent to each other in their own way, but I got three right angles here. So I have a rectangle where consecutive sides are congruent to each other. Because this, I guess this must have to be a right angle. It's a quadrilateral. They had a 360. So a rectangle with sets of consecutive sides is a square. So CADB is a square because it is a rectangle with pairs of consecutive congruent sides. Otherwise, I would have said a kite or just a rectangle, you know, something like that. Um, yeah, but the right angle is because those they told us literally those are perpendicular. Radii are perpendicular to their tangent lines, and D is the shared thing on both of those. So that works. Oh, logic, for sure. Number 39, let's make an argument. Two bike paths, I guess here and here, two bike paths are tangent to an approximately circular pond. Well, is it circular or not? Uh, your class is building a nature trail that begins at the intersection B over a bridge through the center P of the pond. Okay. Oh, are these... Okay, anyway. Your classmate uses the converse of the angle bisector... Oh, theorem to conclude the trail must bisect the angle formed by the bike paths. Is your classmate correct? Explain your reasoning. Yeah, if this is a... They said it's like a circle or whatever. They said center of the pond here, boom. That means these can act as radii. PE and PM are basically radii of this thing. And radii are congruent to each other. So if radii are congruent, you know, the, the bisector, the angle bisector theorem states that an angle bisector, uh, any point in the angle bisector is equidistant to the two points here. But the converse of the theorem says, a point that's equidistant to these two points, and by the way, we know these two points are the same distance because these should be right angles because these are tangential right here. So yeah, it states that this is on an angle bisector right here, which means this angle is congruent to this angle here. So they're asking, can your classmate use the converse to conclude the trail must bisect the angle formed? Yes. Yes, they can. So, excuse me. Yes, they can. Um, it's a lot I can say here. The converse 
of the angle bisector theorem states that a point equidistant to two sides of an angle to two to the sides of an angle must bisect that angle. We know these are uh, equal length sides for, and I kind of say the corresponding parts thing uh, because they form right angles as radii do with tangent lines. And we know, excuse me, it's not that we know they're equal length sides because of that. We know they're equal length sides because of radii. We know that these are sides for which we're comparing equidistance to because they're forming right angles. So I'm just going to use both of those in one thing. I did use the word radii, so I think that that hits them both. The radii make them congruent. The other problem is, excuse me, the other problem is they say an approximately circular pond. So, I mean, we're just going based off the idea notion that I guess it's circular. They should just say circular pond. It's allowed to construct it that way. All right, number 40. Modeling with mathematics. I feel like i got to use a calculator here. A bicycle chain is pulled tightly so that segment MN is a common tangent of the gears. Find the distance between the centers of the gears. So I have this. Excuse me. I have, I guess these are radii. So I have this is going to be a perpendicular, and this is going to be a perpendicular right here. And we're looking for length from L to P. Now, what I would state for something like this is I would basically build a rectangle first, I feel like. So from L to like some other kind of point right here, we can actually build a rectangle to this. Now, we know that these are right angles because that's a radius from the center. It's a radius to a tangent line. They did say that, common tangent. So we can build a rectangle here. And the reason I do that is because this whole thing is 4.3. They said that little part there is 1.8. So that means this is also going to be 1.8. And if that's 1.8, then this guy, this whole thing right here, is 4.3 minus 1.8, which is 2.5 inches. Now, what we're looking at here is another right triangle. I, I feel like i got to like redraw this. So I have like two circles here. I'm going to make them pretty extreme. I have two circles here. And let me let me just make them different. I have two circles here. I have tangent lines, a common common tangent, boom, like that, and then a common tangent, you know, boom, like that. Wait, is that what they did? No, they have one common tangent, and they have their centers, which I did not kind of maintain. But let's pretend like it's kind of these two. So what they're getting at here is that you know I have a right angle to this. I have a right angle to I guess, I guess up here. Yeah, I have a right angle to this right here. These are those right angle things we're talking about. Boom, boom. And then this is where I'm closing off and making this kind of a rectangle like that. Now the whole thing, which I don't really need to use, use anymore, but it's 4.3. And if this little guy is 1.8, then this is also 1.8, which makes this 2.5. And I bring that up because now this is a right triangle right here. And in this right triangle, I should know a couple lengths. I know this 2.5. And if this is 17.6 here, and this is 17.6 here, that's the way a rectangle works. This is the unknown from L to P that we're trying to find in this right triangle. So I will use a calculator here. So I have the two legs, 17.6 of this right triangle, 17.6 and 2.5. And I'm trying to find x. I don't know if there's a faster way to do it, but that's kind of the way that I'm seeing I, I want to do it. I don't know, 17.6 squared, excuse me, a little more than 300. 17.6 squared is, or squared, 309.76, 309.76, I know this is 6.25, let's just let our calculator do that, 6.25, that's me, 316.01, take the square root, this is where you won't have a plus or minus, by the way, x is the length of LP. I hope you know that. Uh, so the square root of this is kind of something random, 17.7. They said find the distance between the gears. Um, I don't know if they want us to round or something like that, but it's the square root of 316.01, which is about 17.8 inches. I'm just going to put that. That's LP. 
and that's my drawing that I have there. So the distance between the gears should be that one. All right, that's how I'm going with that problem there. Questions? All right, all right let's keep going. Let's go to, whoops, did I have more room on there? Oh, total amount of room. Let's go to number 41 on writing. Explain why the diameter of a circle is the longest chord of the circle. Well, I've been saying it all night. Um, I haven't really explained. I guess I have explained why. The diameter, how do I say that? Is the longest chord of a circle because a chord, a chord's end points are on the circle and a diameter end point and diameter's end points are the farthest any two points can be in a circle therefore the farthest they can be is the longest chord you can make so that would be the longest chord the diameter that works all right number 42 how do you see it in the figure Line PA is tangent to the dime. Line P C, uh, ray. Ray PA is tangent to the dime. Ray PC is tangent to the quarter. And ray PB is a common internal tangent. How do you know that these are congruent? Well, it's the theorem. So PA, the, these are both tangent to the dime. So those are congruent to each other. PC is tangent, is uh, congruent to PB. Kind of the transitive, um, do you say the transitive property of equality? Um, I don't know what the name was called. What what was the theorem called? Sorry, this is going to be cut off a little bit. Tangent, uh, external tangent congruence theorem. Yeah, I won't know names. PA is congruent to BB is congruent to PC by reflexive property. I already forgot what it was called. External tangent congruence theorem. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry if I blew, blew up the mic. Let me get water. Mm. Approve. All right. Number 43, approve. In the diagram, ah, ugh, RS is a common internal tangent. So RS, common internal tangent, circle A and circle B. Prove that AC over BC equals RC over SC. I want to fill up water here. <laughs> Give me one second because I'm now... I've run on fumes. Give me one moment. Okay, I'm back. And, you know, I noticed I was originally intimidated by, like, how long I thought that this whole thing would be, but we're only an hour and change in. I thought this would be, like, a two-and-a-half-hour thing. I shouldn't speak so soon. We have six problems to go, and we just hit a proof. I don't know how many other proofs we'll have after this, so uh, I'm not really sure. Anyway, I missed what we had to do. Uh, RS is a common internal tangent to circle A and B. Prove that these are in proportion to each other. Okay, proportionality proofs are generally under the context that you have similar triangles. So the corresponding side lengths would be proportional if that's the case. So, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I don't know if I have to go two-column format. It just says prove it. Um, I'll, I'll go two-column format, at least for this one. We have, I mean, I'll state out loud what we have so you're not too heavy on the like, well, I wasn't required to do a two-column proof here, so tell me about it. Or should I? You know what? I won't do a two-column. I could, I could do a paragraph proof. I could describe it in other ways. Okay, they said that it's a common internal tangent. So if this is a tangent, you, they said these are circles here. For, so from A to R, that is a radius. A radius intersects with a tangent at a 90-degree angle. So that's 90 degrees, and that's 90 degrees. All right angles are congruent to each other. I'll just call it angle R congruent to angle S all I'm not doing a two column right angles are congruent that's really the part that bugs me most um, it's something that it's like PTSD that I grew up with having had to do it in eighth grade uh, all the two column proofs because I had to draw the figure basically I had to do what I would do for you guys but I'd write draw the figure do the given do the proof 
and then draw the statements, reasons, and stuff like that. I really got PTSD from doing that all the time over and over. It was just huge. Okay, there's that. Um, I guess you could say they're parallel. Well, uh, here, let's talk about the vertical angles. We got vertical angles right here. These are congruent. If I can get angle, angle, I'm good. So let's say angle RCA is congruent to angle SCB. Those are vertical angles that are congruent. So that's another reason. Um, so these two triangles are similar. So what are we going to call them? Let's call them, well, I just said RCA. Let's do that. Triangle RCA is similar to triangle RCA SCB by angle angle. I mean, this is no different than a two column proof. Why am I so bothered by saying two column? Because I have to write numbers and do the visuals and stuff. So what was the last thing? AC over BC. So AC over BC, yeah, those parts correspond. AC, BC, it's the third and second letters, third and second letters, equals RC over SC. Yeah, so AC over BC equals RC over SC. Now, I abbreviate this thing. Corresponding sides of similar triangles are proportional. Corresponding sides of similar triangles are proportional. The triangles are similar, therefore, we can create proportions out of those sets that correspond. All right, there's my version of that proof. I think I'll use that. Number 44, thought-provoking. A polygon is circumscribed about a circle when every side of the polygon is tangent to the circle. Well, we saw a problem like this, that perimeter one before. Uh, in the diagram, quadrilateral ABCD is circumscribed about circle Q. Is it always true that AB plus CD, AB plus... CD equals AD plus BC, justify your answer. Uh, maybe. Um, let's do the whole, I marked these before like this. So these two are congruent. These two are congruent. Remember, this is the ex triangle external, excuse me, what was it called? Ex external tangent congruence theorem. So if I mark these, AB, AB plus CD equals AD plus BC. Let's actually, instead of doing that, let's let's put variables. So let's put little X's. Oh, we have that letter on there. What don't we have? A, B, C, D. Let's do E, F, G, H. These are E's. These are F's. These are G's. And these are H's. Okay. Let's see if we have basically the same things come out here. Does... A, B plus C, D equal, hmm, equal A, D plus B, C. That's the question I had. Okay, A, B would be E plus H. E plus H, and then C, D is F plus G. Now, yeah, yeah, I think it's going to be all these. So, A, D is E plus F, and B, C is G plus H. Same letters. Uh, let's put them in alphabetical order. E, F, G, H, and this says E, F, G, H as well. Yes. So, yes. Yes. They'll always be congruent to each other. Equal to each other. I don't know if I knew that. I probably should have. Number 45. Mathematical connections. Find the values of X and Y. Justify your answer. So in this figure, 45, in this figure, from P to Q and P, T, P to T should be the same. I don't know if there's reason to believe that Q to R and T to S should be the same, but because P to S and P to R should be the same, so these should be congruent here as well. So this is, might be a system of equations, or I can use the x to solve for y. So let's start with the 2x minus 5 equals x plus 8. Subtract x, add 5, you get x equals 13. Now, <clears throat> although, although I could use, I don't know what the word is, but although I could use some property, basically addition and subtraction, to conclude that these two must be congruent to each other, let's go more full bore with this thing and talk about the sum of those things, that PR, you know, PR is all of 2x minus 5 plus 4y minus 1, which is 2x plus 4y minus 6, and then all of PS is 
x plus 8 plus x plus 6, which is 2x plus 14. So I want to say that 2x plus 4y minus 6 equals 2x plus 14. Now I was going to say, let's take our x's and substitute them to solve, but it looks like it's not going to matter. When I subtract 2x, it's gone. So it looks like y is completely independent of x, ultimately. 4y minus 6 equals 14. 4y equals 20, so y equals 5. Y equals 5 is my answer. Now to uh, verify, would I still get the same answer if I did substitute 13 for x in here? 13 plus 6 is 19. 4 times 5 minus 1 is 19. Yeah, you still get the same thing regardless. So it works out, no matter which way I go about it. Love it. Number four, I have three more questions. And to proof, proof, and construction, and reasoning. All right, so I have two sets of proofs here. So not so fast. Let's see how long we'll go. Maybe I can get away with not doing a two-column proof before. Uh, prove, this one feels more two-column proof-esque, right? Just the way that it's written. Prove the external tangent congruence. I said we'd probably have to prove this one. Prove the external tangent congruence theorem. Let's use these. Given that these are tangent, prove SR is congruent to ST. Got it. All right. Uh, I'm fine with doing it. I just, it's just, yeah. Yeah. So let's go statements and reasons. I forgot these are still made as lines. Okay. It's been a while since I've done some sets of these. I don't even remember. What was our last chapter? <laughs> um, Pythagorean triangles and stuff, right? Did we really do proofs during that time? Like trig and stuff? Did we do proofs? Not really. Or graphing? No. So I don't know. I, I kind of felt pretty good about the stuff that we did and didn't do. SR and ST are tangent to circle P. This is given. Now there's a drawing above. I'm, I'm going to be using that. In fact, I'm going to make triangle things because I'm going to make radii and all that stuff. Just give me a second. So statement two. So if they're tangent, it's a common endpoint here. I forget the name of the thing, but basically these two things are congruent to each other, right? That's the uh, segment SR is congruent to segment ST. That's the external tangent congruence theorem, I believe it's called. External tangent congruence theorem. All right, that's one set. Now, this is going to be all about, what, what are we trying to find? SR, oh, we have to, oh, we have to prove the theorem. Time out, let me stop, let me stop. Forget what I just did. <laughs> Time out, okay, okay, okay. We, okay, we gotta prove that. <laughs> I'm done with my proof, guys, I use the theorem. No, prove the theorem, my bad. Okay, here's what I do plan on doing then. I do plan on making like radii <laughs> right here. The, the basic premise of this one, guys, is we're going to prove two triangles congruent and use CPCTC to show that last part. So I'm making two triangles like this, right? Now, here are other parts I can mention, other theorems and stuff that we had. I can, I don't know if I have to say draw, I guess so. We're going to draw um, PR, PT, and PS. That's construction. Just by construction, I'm drawing those things. Now, PR and PT are radii. That's definition of a radius. The definition being going from the center to an endpoint. So definition of, whoa, of radius or radii. And all radii are congruent. So I can say PR is congruent to PT. So a lot of steps. See, this is the stuff that I don't like to do. <laughs> all this stuff. PR congruent to PT. Also definition of radii. I don't know. All radii are congruent. I'll just say that. All radii are congruent. Yeah, that's not a definition. But all radii are congruent. Okay. So those two are congruent, right? Now, knowing that the radii... Uh, I don't know the name of this theorem, but the ones where the radius intersects with the tangent line at 90 degree angle. I want to say that those are perpendicular to each other. Let me find out what that one's called and then go back. Sorry, it's going to look a little wonky. It's called the tangent line to circle theorem. And they talk about them being perpendicular. So 
in the tangent line to circle theorem, angle R and angle T are right angle, uh, not, not right angles, not yet. Uh, PR is perpendicular to RS and PT is perpendicular to PTS. I, f I f forgot what it was called. Tangent line to radius theorem. I forget what it was called. I'm going to say that. Tangent line to radius theorem. Sorry if that's wrong. It's the one that I said out loud before. If they're perpendicular, then they make right angles. Yeah, there's a lot I have to write here. Sorry, this is the part that I hate about proofs. So angle R and T are right angles. Angle R and angle T are right angles by definition of right angles, or of perpendicular lines, I should say. Perpendicular lines make right angles. Uh, number seven is these are right triangles. So triangle PRS and triangle PTS are right triangles. Now the reason I say this step is we're gonna prove this using HL. Not side angle side or anything like that. Our right triangles by definition of right triangles. Um, and using HL you need to say that you do it in right triangles. Because here's the thing, I'm gonna say that PS is congruent to itself. That's the reflexive property. That's also the hypotenuse of each of these right triangles. Otherwise angle side side is not one that works. So I'm gonna say PS is congruent to itself by the reflexive property of congruence. Reflexive property. And then now therefore these two triangles are congruent to each other. So triangle PRS is congruent to triangle PTS. This is the HL congruence theorem, HL. And now those two are congruent to each other by CPCTC. So if I have two congruent triangles right here, then their corresponding parts here are congruent. That's RS and TS. How do they say them? SR and ST. SR is congruent to ST by CPCTC. CPCTC. Okay. All right. There is that proof. It's quite a bit. It's Really, it was the building parts of the proof that took a while. The whole steps two, three, and four are all connected. Five, six, and seven are all connected. If I could make two through four one statement, five through seven one statement, I would have felt a lot better about that. Otherwise, it's just a lot of annoyance going through there. All right, here we go. Two more questions. Number 47 is another proof and two parts. Two proofs. Oh, indirect proofs. What are those? Are those ones where you assume something's true and then it finds out to be false or something like that? I'm trying to remember. Use the diagram to prove each part of the biconditional in the tangent line to circle theorem. Hopefully they tell me what they are. Um, copying and pasting. Okay, let's see. Prove indirectly that if a line is tangent to a circle, then it is perpendicular to a radius. Prove if a line is tangent to a circle is perpendicular to a radius. Hint, if you assume line M is not perpendicular to QP, then the perpendicular segment, they're telling me everything, then the perpendicular segment from point Q to line M must intersect line M at some other point R. Okay. So let me just type out what they kind of said. First, let's assume that line M is not perpendicular to circle P. I want to find circle K. So let's assume they're not perpendicular. So how did they, I, I mean, do I just say exactly what they said, if that's why? So the perpendicular segment from Q from Q to M, from Q to M, uh, intersects M at some other point R, some other point R. Oh, okay, so if they, if it's not perpendicular, 
then it does have to intersect at some other point. So if these aren't perpendicular, then there's another point here, R, that would be perpendicular, right? Kind of like that. Like, okay, just pretend like that's the perpendicular one. Then if that's the case, then that has to be longer Q, QP would have to be longer than QR because QR should be the shortest one. So, then QR, QP, QR, draw from QP. Sorry, then QR would be less than QP in that case, right? If QR is truly perpendicular, QP should actually be longer. I know through this drawing it's not, but because I had to slant this thing over. Uh, QR would be less than QP. So, R, so the only way that that's possible, remember, P is on the circle. So if QR is less than it, then R would be inside the circle. Then R, or so R, must be inside the circle. This isn't circle P, this is circle Q. I apologize, I, I said that before. Um, must be inside the circle. And if that's the case, then then if R is inside the circle, then M is a secant line because a secant line would be touching two different points on the circle, right? These are, R is a point that's on line M. It's touching two points that are on the circle. So, and M is a secant line. But this is a contradiction because M is a tangent line. So, M must be perpendicular to QP. I know these ones aren't easy. They're, they're not, not even easy for me. I know indirect proofs are kind of like, uh, kind of iffy. Because um, line M is a tangent line. And so if we called it a secant line, then that doesn't really work out the way that we'd want it to. So there's my part A. Fun. Okay. Uh, part B. Part B. So part B, prove indirectly that if a line is perpendicular, to a radius at its endpoint, then the line is tangent to the circle. Ugh. I'm not very good at these because they, they didn't give me a hint this time. Is that is that perpendicular part? Oh, I made that perpendicular part. Sorry about that. There we go. Let me do that again. All right, let's see if I can figure this one out. Prove indirectly that if a line is perpendicular to a radius at its endpoint. Oh, so maybe we should do the uh, perpendicular part. Then the line is tangent to the circle. So last time, so I think we first assume that it's not tangent to the circle, right? So I think we say first, first we, <laughs> first we assume it's not tangent to the circle. So assume M is not tangent circle Q. We temporarily, we assume that line M is not tangent to circle Q. Okay, if we assume it's not tan oops, if we assume it's not tangent to circle Q, why did we do the point R last time? I, I mean, they dropped the hint, but how did we know perpendicular segment from Q must to M intersects M at some other point R? Oh, perpendicularly. That's that's what they're saying. The perpendicular segment does that. Um, so, can we do another point R here? If we assume M is not tangent to circle Q, then that must mean that M must intersect at some other point, right? It can't just intersect at one point. Then M intersects, or also intersects, at some other point, at point R. So... You know, again, this doesn't work, right? It's broken, right? Because R, you know, R would be somewhere right here. And then line M would have to be like that. So it would be a secant line in the same kind of way. It would intersect at that thing. So let's just pretend like there's an R right there. Somehow M bends to, to hit it, right? I think that's what we want to talk about. So QP and QR would both be radii, right? Because they're both points on a circle and Q is the center. So QP and QR are both radii of circle Q. So then QP is congruent to QR, right? Because radii are congruent. I'll just say QP equals QR. Something like that. 
but m is perpendicular to qp, right? The first thing that we talk about in this thing, I, I lost my screen here, the um, doo -doo -doo, um, proven directly if a line's perpendicular to a radius at its endpoint. Well, we know it's already perpendicular to it though, right? So that, that part's not something we don't temporarily assume. But because, whoa, that's not because, because m is perpendicular to qp, that would mean that qp would be, have to be less than qr because qr is not perpendicular to qp and the shortest distance would be the perpendicular one. But that's a contradiction to this whole thing because r is supposed to, qp is supposed to be equal to qr. So, right, to qp equals qr. But that contradicts itself. Hold on. Let me put this in its the same paragraph. But this is a contradiction. So M must be tangent to Q. I'm not I'm not very good at these um, in explaining what I'm trying to do with that thing. But, you know, again, M would have to hit two other points. You know, if it's not tangent to P, if it's not tangent, then it's hitting another point somewhere, right? Tangent only hits one point. So this hits two points. That would mean these two things are congruent to each other. But a perpendicular distance, as we know it's already perpendicular, means this should be the shortest line possible. This couldn't also be perpendicular in that same kind of way. That's just not how it works. So if this is perpendicular, it's shorter than that other one. But it can't be because they're supposed to be equal. So there's a contradiction there. If, every, if only everything was done through proof land, then I think we'd be all bit much better off with it. Uh, indirect proof land, I should say. All right, the last question here is number 48. Now... It was 24 minutes ago that I said this thing was a breeze, and that was only like five problems ago. So I'm definitely making just fantastic time here, am I not? All right, number 48, the last question. Hopefully it's a good one, like a, a short one. Uh, in the diagram, AB equals AC equals 12. All right, it's a isosceles triangle, I think. Is that what they said? Yeah, AB, AB is 12, AC is 12. So this is 12. And this is 12. BC is 8. And all three segments are tangent to P. So like these are congruent to each other. These are congruent to each other. These are congruent to each other. I'm sorry. I did that wrong. These, these are... Let's do that again. There we go. These are congruent to each other. But because it's like an isosceles triangle thing... Would that work? Yeah. Then these two would be congruent to each other in their own way. So yeah, let me kind of do it that way. These are all congruent to each other like that. That'll work. That'll work. So if this whole thing's eight, that would make this four, 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 and 12 minus four is eight and eight. All right. There's good stuff. Is that the question? No. What is the radius of circle P? Justify your answer. So we got to find... Well, any of these three things right here. All right, this will have to do with right triangles. I just don't know where, because any of these can be like right angles, right? So I could do like a right angle here, and then I have, boom, a right triangle where this is eight, this is unknown, and that's, um, I don't know how to get that. Um, or I mean, I don't have that information. Let's do... Well, this would be a right angle, right? If this is a bisector thingy right here. Well, and it's a radius to a tangent line. So that would be a right angle. And I have this length as 4 and this length as 12. So I can get this whole thing here. So I can call it AE. Let's start with that. Let's, I don't know if that will help me yet. But AE squared plus 4 squared equals 12 squared. And that's plus 16 equals 144. AE squared equals 128. And AE is the square root of 128. Um... Uh, um, for 32, it must be a bigger number, 16, 16 and 8, oh, there must be a bigger one, uh, 30, 64, 64, so AE is the square root of 64 times square root of 2, or 8 root 2, so whole thing of AE is 8 root 2, I feel like I want to copy that diagram down again, or like, yeah, there we go. So this whole thing is 8 root 2 right here. 8 root 2. But I got to find, like, maybe just this part. 
And that's one. Hmm. Well, how about this? Let's use another right triangle, right? I talked about kind of having this one. Now I know that length. So this here, and I know that this is eight. And I don't know this one, but I know that this is X. And then like that would be another X. Like, like that's my radius, right? I got to solve for that. So I can say eight squared plus X squared equals eight root two squared. Oh, 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 oh. Eight root two is not just this part. Eight root two is the whole thing. So I can call this guy right here then eight root two minus X. Because the whole thing's eight root two and that's an X. So I can say x squared plus 8 squared equals 8 root 2 minus x quantity squared like that. I think if I solve for x, this will be my radius. So this will be my final answer, whatever I get here. So x squared plus 64 equals, uh, this is 8 root 2 squared, so the 128, 128, and then minus double this thing, 2 times 8 root 2, so that's 16 x root 2. I don't know if that's the best way to write it, but there it is, plus x squared. x squareds cancel, thank goodness. Uh, and I have 16, I'm going to add 16 x root 2 over, 16 x root 2 equals, subtract 64 over, you get 64, divide both sides by 16, I get x root 2 equals 4, divide both sides by root 2, I get 4 over root 2, and when you rationalize the denominator, I hope that works out, that's 4 root 2 over 2, and that's 2 root 2. So my length my radius in this case is 2 root 2. So what I did was I used Pythagorean theorem twice. I used Pythagorean theorem with this big triangle right here, this big right triangle there, because that's a right angle that's made, same thing with the radius stuff, and I got 8 root 2 as this whole length there. Then I sought another right triangle here. These are both x's, so this guy's 8 root 2 minus x, the hypotenuse of this right triangle. And I solved that one, Pythagorean theorem, but it used a little more algebra in the expansion of this guy to solve with. Okay, uh, Okay, that's my final answer there. That's my final answer to my final question. So guys, that ought to do it for this one. This is Mr. Robinson. Thank you so much for watching the section 10.1 as we get into some parts of circles. I don't know what's next, if it's the angle measure parts or chord relationships and stuff like that. There are a lot of other things that will hit and hopefully we'll start to get used to them. But guys, thank you so much for watching. Check out the description section down below if you want to find anything else in the PDF-based stuff and the timestamps. Take care. I will see you in the next one.